Let's wait for it to start. Uh -huh. That's it. OK, uh, thank you very much, Shireen. OK, welcome to those in attendance at this remote meeting of the Planning Development Management Committee of Aberdeen City Council on Thursday, the 22nd of April 2021. Please note that this meeting will be recorded and published online for public access after the meeting. Can all members leave their cameras on but mute your microphones when not speaking? The microphone should only be switched on when you're invited to speak. Guidance on how to do this is contained within the guidance issued to you. I will now ask the clerk to advise of the members participating today and for all members to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced by the clerk so that it's clear for the recording of the meeting and can also be recorded by, for the minute. As this meeting contains quasi-judicial business, members are reminded that they should not leave the room or the meeting during consideration of any application. If I could just ask Ms McBain to do a roll call, please. Thank you, Convener. If members can just indicate that they're present for the recording. Um, convener? Here. Vice Convener? Here. Councillor Allen? Here. Councillor Cook? Here. Councillor Copeland? Here. Councillor Cormie? Yeah. Councillor Greg. Here. Councillor McKenzie. Here. And Councillor Malik. Here. Okay, that's all nine members present. Convener, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. McBain. Okay, if we could turn to the agenda, item one point one is motion against officers' recommendation procedural note, which is on page five to six. Unless I hear otherwise, I'll assume everyone has that. Moving on to 2.1, which is a determination of urgent business. There is none. Moving on to 3.1, declarations of interest. Has any member got any declaration of interest? OK, I'm not seeing any hands. OK, moving on swiftly then to the minutes of the previous meeting at 4.1, which are on pages 9 to 10. These are the minutes of the Planning Development Committee of March 2021. Is there anybody... Got any comments? No. Can we agree that they're an accurate minute? Okay. Again, I'll take your silence as agreement. 4.2 is the minute of the meeting of the Planning Development Management Committee predetermining hearing on the 25th of February 2021. They're on pages 11 to 20. Again, can I just agree they're an accurate minute? Okay. Thank you, folks. Moving on to the committee planner at 5.1, which is laid out on pages 21 24 to 24. Again, there for your information. Any comments? No? Oh, Councillor yeah. Gray. Uh, thank you. Um, just a query um, about the forthcoming business. Um, after uh, May, there is no scheduled business for each meeting, although there's a list at the end of about 14 applications. Um, is this just a blip where, where the applications have not been able to be allocated to a specific date, um, because otherwise, it, otherwise, um, it's not really a business planner um, unless we do allocate to dates. Mrs. Beatty, thank you, convener. I think um, Councillor Greg, given some of the economic uncertainties that we have, um, particularly around about um, some of the planning applications, it would be unhelpful to be able to schedule them at the moment because there are a number which um, we are expecting further um, studies or work to come through. So for that reason, we have we have tried to provide the certainty for the ones that are coming up, but um, we haven't we haven't gone beyond that. We obviously keep that situation under advisement, um, and as you know, and as things become a little bit more um, back to normal for the construction industry and um, and the subsequent parts of it, including the planning process. But we, we will look at that. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Mrs Beatty. Thank you, Councillor Greg. OK, I don't see any other hands. OK, moving on now to the general business of the committee, where the recommendation is one of approval. The first item is at 6.1, which is detailed planning permission for the erection of a one and a half storey extension to the rear of nine Royfold Crescent Aberdeen, planning reference 201267, and the planning officer is Jimmy Ledbetter. Mr Ledbetter. Morning, morning all. Morning. I'll just, um, <clears throat> just upload my uh, presentation. Thank you. Second, please. Um, 
Um, That's right. work, Jamie. Can, can, can you see that? Yes. It, I can't see it yet, but it might be coming up. Might just be taking a minute to load. Yeah, right. It's beginning to circle, so I'm sure it's coming. Okay. That's it. Yeah, it's there. Thank you, Jamie. Right, OK. I'll get started. Um, so, so can everyone see the slides? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Great. OK, yeah. So um, as the convener said, um, this is a, a planning application for the erection of a one and a half storey uh, extension to the rear of a um, one and a half storey semi detached dwelling house at nine threefold crescent. Um, the reason for um, this application's referral to committee is that there have been six objections and also an objection from the local community council. I'd also like to um, highlight that um, since these, since uh, the community council's objection was submitted, and many of the object and many of the objections from members of the public, um, the proposal has changed following negotiation with the applicant, um, and neighbours were re uh, were re uh, notified as a result of um, the uh, material changes. Um, so, in terms of the summary of objections um, from both the community council and members of the public, they relate to um, considered adverse uh, residential amenity impact on adjoining neighbour uh, Seven Royfall Crescent. Um, the extension's uh, projection exceeds uh, the, S the, sup the Householder Development Guide Supplementary Guidance. Um, the extension is perceived to be over development. Um, the extension would not be in keeping with existing extensions on Royfall Crescent. Um, there would be an adverse impact on the character of Royfall Crescent and the proposals not deemed to be compliant with policy H1 and H2. So in terms of uh, the street context, um, this proposal is one um, of only two semi-detached properties on Royfold Crescent um, on, the, on the on its western side. Um, so the uh, the site is uh, neighbour to the north by a detached uh, property uh, number 11 Royfold Crescent. Um, Royfold Crescent sits to the east. Um, Number seven, um, which is all the adjoining semi-detached property, sits to the south, and there's also um, an office building which lies uh, to the west. So, in terms of the, so, so sorry, this is the uh, this is the current proposals of the uh, well existing building, shall I say? Um, so it's a one and a half story building with a single story annex to the rear, which is uh, which is what's proposed to be extended and um, the adjoining um, semi which can't be seen is effect effectively a replica of the application property and as you can see has a um, um, shares one half of this rear, uh, rear annex single story annex so i'll just show you some site visit well site photos so everyone can get a good impression of of the application property um, this application prop the application property is the one um, by, by my cursor. This is um, an image taken from Google Street View, and you can see that the property lies above the the height of the road. This is the uh, adjoining property number seven here. Turning to the rear of the property, um, you can see that this is the single story annex to the rear, uh, which is proposed to be extended, well widened, the height increased. Um, I'll I'll move on to the proposed plans in a second, uh, and that's a further. Um, understanding appreciation of of the full rear elevation of the application property. Um, this property, uh, sorry, this photograph here is an image um, submitted by um, the um, the adjoining neighbour who's objected, just so members can get an appreciation of um, what their rear garden look like looks like. Uh, and some f oops, <clears throat> some further site um, photos here submitted by the agent in light of um, not being able to actually go on the application site. Um, and this just gives you a better appreciation of what the uh, boundary treatment is between the application property and number 11 Royfall Crescent to the north. Moving on to the proposed plans. So the proposed plans seek to maintain the existing projection um, of the 
existing single storey um, annex. But as you can see, it would um, seek to add an additional floor of accommodation within the roof space. Um, it does have an asymmetrical form, um, that that being that um, the eaves on the um, mutual boundary about half a metre higher to sort of tie in with the um, the ridge height of the adjoining neighbours um, um, single storey annex roof plane. There will also be um, a dormer on the northern roof plane and um, a window in the gable which would serve an ensuite bathroom. <clears throat> this uh, this image here tries to, this 3D image submitted by the um, the applicant seeks to give everyone a, a an improved appreciation of how the um, the extension might tie in with the existing property. So the main considerations in determining this application have really been down to um, how do, how well does the scale and design of the extension relate to the application property and the general surrounding area, and also. Um, what residential amenity impacts might arise from from the increased uh, height and, and massing of of the uh, of the extension relative to the existing um, property? Um, number set. Well, so consideration has been afforded to the residential amenity impacts, that being um, privacy, daylighting, sunlighting, uh, in particular to um, adjoining to the adjoining semi number seven and also uh, given that the the dorm on the northern roof slope um, faces the um, the boundary with number 11 consideration has been afforded um, to what impact that might have on the privacy of, of number of uh, of uh, the residents in number 11. Um, so upon applying um, the supplementary guidance set out um, in the appendix of the household development guide um, we have concluded that um, we do not feel as if this proposal, although higher and although the projection of the extension would exceed the SG guidance, um, it wouldn't um, extend any further than the existing and therefore it's reasonable uh, to have considered to allow the applicant to to, um, to maintain the existing project, uh, projection, providing that there was no um, adverse amenity impact on the adjoining neighbour in particular, which um, upon consideration, we do not feel as if there would be. Um, we do appreciate that the, um, the adjoining neighbour has expressed some concern, but we do not share those concerns. Equally, um, given that the uh, the position of the dormer relative to um, the to, um, to the neighbouring property to the north number 11, um, given that it will be orientated to look into the um, into the hipped roof space and not directly overlook the private rear garden ground, as well as some intermittent uh, vegetation, we do not feel as if that ha would have an unacceptable impact on number 11's privacy. Um, also, um, in terms of the actual scale and design of the proposal, as you can see from the 3D image, um, the ridge height would sit well below the, the principal ridge height of the existing building. The eaves height, so it, um, certainly on the the inner, on the on the northern side, would tie in with the um, the eaves height of the existing building, um, and the extension overall would read as a one and a half storey extension, which would be subservient in in scale and height to existing extension. So taking the, the design. Um, the scale, uh, the potential um, residential amenity uh, implications into account, um, it's felt that um, this would be an acceptable solution uh, for the site and therefore the application is recommended for approval. Okay, thank you very thank much. You very much. Mr. Ledger. Um, um, can you put your, your mic off? Thanks. Thanks. And take your screen down. down. Can, can you take that the your slide down, Jamie, please? That's, it's still there. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm trying to get rid of it. I don't know. Um for some reason the X button's not it's not letting me. Okay. Um, I, I can't even offer any advice because I'm not good for this. Yeah. 
That's it. Right. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, questions for Mr. Ledbetter. I see Councillor Allen first. Thank you, convener. I've got two questions. One, um, when he, he talked about slight amendments to the original plan, did the objectors still maintain their objections even to the alterations? And the second question is, at the end of the ex proposed extension, there's a wee window. There's also a skylight. Um, I may be concerned that the wee window allows access over the gardens the view of the neighbours. Is it essential to have the two because they seem quite close, like they would both be in the same room? That's uh, me. Hi, hi, hi Councillor Allen. Yeah, so um, following the neighbour notification, the uh, adjoining uh, neighbour um, from who owns number seven, um, Mr and Mrs Taylor, uh, they, they did submit further objections. The other five objectors, I don't think they did let me just uh, there was certainly no further objection from the community council let me just um, double check apologies just to see if there's any further objection from any anyone else other than number seven No, uh, the, the only further objection following the neighbour notification process came from the owners of the adjoining property, Mr and Mrs Taylor. Um, in respect of your second question, um, it's covered in the report. Um, the, the skylight and the gable would serve a non-habitable ensuite bathroom. Uh, the bathroom window in the gable, um, not. A, I think it would be set about, um, let me just go back to my report, it would be set about two metres off the boundary and the, um, the proposed roof light, which would also serve the the, um, the bathroom, wouldn't really present any views, unlike the dormer serving the, the bathroom into, into number 11. So we were set out in the report, we were comfortable that that arrangement wouldn't have any adverse impact on the privacy of either the adjoining neighbour number seven in their rear garden ground or um, number 11. OK, thank you for, for that. But the answer to my first question wasn't very clear. I was asking if anybody actually withdrew their um, comments after the adjustments to the plans. Sorry. Not if anybody new came in. Sorry, Ap uh, apologies. No, no one, no one withdrew their objections. OK, thank you. That's me convenient. Thank you. OK, thanks, Councillor Allen. I've got Councillor Cook next. Thanks, convener. Um, just, just so I'm understanding that the, the plans and the photos correctly. Um, so, if you are standing in the garden of number seven, um, the 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 higher bit of the the, the proposed new extension, if, if effectively, um, you'd still see a, a a sloping roof that would simply be a a continuation of the of the sloping roof on the number seven side, is that right? Hi, Councillor Cook. Um, yes, so so the, the, the eaves height of the extension along the mutual boundary is designed to tie in with, um, is designed to rise up to the height of the ridge. So the um, so number seven sloping roof would be maintained and the, the, the extension has been designed to try and maintain um, you know, a seamless gradient, pretty much, um, with with um, the uh, yeah number seven's um, roof roof slope. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that that made I, I I thought that was the case, but I just wanted to kind of double check. Um, and then um, a further question, Jamie. I think I might have misheard you. Um, but I think when you were talking, you said that the or did did I hear you say that the um, the proposal would be slightly wider than what's there at the moment, or is it still using the same footprint? No, it, it would be wider, yes. Uh, Okie doke. And then just the other final question was on um, uh, on the shadowing and the, the potential loss of sunlight for a number seven. Um, I know this was raised by the, the folk at number seven who were objecting. Um, but Looking at the plans, basically the, the rear gardens are 
facing west and number seven is to the south so yeah could you just comment on that a bit further so i've got my head around this properly so um so obviously the the application prop well the application property lies to the north so the extension would be to the north um the sun would obviously set in the west um and what's not shown in that picture as well um is that the um, sorry, in, in, in number seven's photograph is that a lot of their garden is already heavily vegetated beyond that lawn area to the west. Um, and, you know, in line with the, the supplementary guidance appendices, uh, upon doing our calculations, mindful that the extension sits in the north, um, we didn't feel as if um, the great, well, the extension effectively would cross the centre roof plane of the um of the bay window uh, so this is on number seven on the rear of number seven's property that that bay window sort of tucked in adjacent to um their single story annex which is the which is the the, the method that we would normally um apply um you know to to, to um sort of um allay any concerns that there would be any sort of undue daylight issues um so mindful that the extension sits in the north mindful of the method that we would norm the 45 degree method we'd normally apply and also taking into account um the existing um rear garden arrangements um within number sevens and the application properties uh, we we felt as if there would be an acceptable daylighting impact on the adjoining property number seven thanks um and then the so final point was it's not it's not going to be visible from the avenue itself the only place it's going to be visible from is, is from the back that, yeah sorry that that's that's a, a point um i did allude to in my report but didn't in my presentation that yeah given that the well the height of the extension would sit well below the the, the ridge it wouldn't have any townscape impact you know even from any of the public thoroughfares sort of to the well to the south or west primarily um so yeah that that was another point that i should have made in the presentation that um given that the scale of it would be subservient to the existing structure um it wouldn't have any it would have no negligible impact thanks i think that's me done okay thanks councillor cook i've got councillor greg next yep thank you um could i please ask uh, mr ledbetter about those material changes which were made during the process of the application. Um, I'd be particularly interested to know um, what mitigation there is in terms of, of, of height or otherwise. Is it, is it possible to have some detail, please? So, I'll, uh, yeah, I shall aim to provide that. Um, if you just give me a second to get up the original plans. Right. W would you like me to share them on the screen? Yeah, that's fine, Councillor. Uh, sorry, Mr. Ledbetter. <laughs> can, can you see those? Yeah, we can see them. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so what you, what you will notice and and which um was one of the the main additional reasons of objection from the adjoining neighbor was that the ridge height um has been risen uh, by about half half a meter um but the whole purpose of the um of seeking the amendments was quite a lot of negotiation with the agent was to try and improve the proportions of the extension to try and make it read more as a one and a half story extension rather than a two story given that the eaves height in particular on this uh, northern side, as you can see, um, was, I think, about the same height as, as that on, on the shared boundary. Um, so 
and also that there was two dormer windows. They were positioned uh, um, about eight metres off the boundary with number 11. So therefore, they could have had an adverse amenity impact given the proximity and relationship to the um, to the neighbour's garden to the north. Um, you'll also note in the gable that there was two, um, two windows, uh, one window which was much closer to the um, to number seven's rear garden area, so had, and that actually served a bedroom, in, um, which is a habitable space as opposed to the existing arrangement, which is proposed now, which is an ensuite, which obviously had greater capacity to to peer into number seven's rear garden. So, so the design um, proposals really were, um, sorry, the, the changes, the motive for that was to try and obviously um, get a proposal which is, um, doesn't have any adverse uh, privacy impact on either number 11 or number 7. Um, and also, as I said, from a design perspective, it was felt uh, that the extension would read much better with the building if, if it was more distinctively one and a half story. So that meant sort of um, creating a, an asymmetrical gable um, to bring the eaves down on the northern side to time with the existing building. Um, the eaves on the shared boundary didn't really change because what we were trying, you know, mindful of of daylighting impacts on number seven, that we wanted to try and maintain a, a roof gradient, which was sort of fairly seamless with with the um, with number seven's um, single story extension. Um, so that that was that's been the main changes. Perhaps, Mr. Levitt, could you take up the, the kind of the proposed one now? So it's just so that we can kind of visualise it, it might be helpful. Um, I'm not sure if I can, I don't think I can share two screens at the same time though. No, you can get rid of that one. It's okay. Oh, it's right. just so that we, sorry. That's sorry. <laughs> okay. It's just so that we can see. Yeah. Right. It's a bit like a before and after, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, and, and then if if you if you want me to um, to upload the three D image, if that you know once you've looked at these plans, if you feel as if that would help you at all, um, I'm, we'll do that. Right. Um, can ev everyone see those? It's just yeah. it's just coming up. I think it's warming up. Um, And yep, that's it back up. Thank you. Is that helpful, Councillor Gray, to be able to see the before and after? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have a follow up query on, on that. Um, on page 43, um, there's mention of the um, uh, residential amenity impact in relation to daylighting and shadowing. So it, it it's useful to see um, what has resulted from the from the negotiations, um, and I, th I think it would just be helpful just to have that explanation as to why it's now in policy, why, why it's now acceptable, um, what, what's now being proposed as a result of those changes um, in relation to daylight. So sorry, I, I didn't quite grasp the. Um... The thrust yeah. of that question. Uh, on on page forty three, right. um, there's the evaluation on daylighting. Yes. Um, could you please explain why why it's in policy? Why that result is in policy? Why is that? I think he's referring to the changes made to bring yeah. it into policy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, well, initially, I don't think that we really had any da daylighting um, concerns. As I said, the, the initial concerns was more based upon what privacy impacts the original proposal might have on number seven, number 11. He, also, we didn't think that the design was as good as it could be and as sympathetic to the existing building. Um, mm -hmm. So we obviously are now considering the proposal that we have before us and you know, as I said to to Council Cook, having considered um, that proposal, though it's got a higher ridge height, as has already been noted. Um, you know, when we ran the calculations against the Household Development Guide Appendix, the 45 degree uh, method, um, mindful also that the building sits to the north um, and that the the ridge height is is set way in um, 
from, from the shared boundary. Um, obviously, it, it is a slightly subjective argument, but you know, we we felt that there wouldn't be an unacceptable loss of daylight um, to any of the windows on the rear elevation of number seven. Thank you. That's Thank you, Councillor Greg. Uh, Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> um, I wanted to ask, just I know what it says in the poor report, but at a community council meeting, it was said that it is a, a two story development, but obviously it is just one and a half. Um, so I'm seeing Jamie's nodding, so that's also yes. And if, uh, as I understand it, it's building something on top of an existing footprint in its simplest terms. That would be correct. Um, part correct. So it does maintain the the same projection as the existing, um, but it does it does widen um, the proposal does widen um, the existing extension, but away from the shared boundary with number seven. So that would be into number nine's garden. Well, the application, yeah, the application site is number nine, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, I wanted to ask, it was actually picking up on something Councillor Allen said that um, generated a thought. Obviously, this was um, resubmitted, um, and, and Councillor Allen was asking about um, those that had objected. And I'm just wondering, would if those people that had objected in the first instance would have they known, as it, as it, as it stated in the letter, whether they would have to re-object or could equally withdraw their application or withdraw their objection based on the changes? So would have they known to have done that? I, mean, I know what we know, but would... Um, well, I'd, to be honest, I don't actually know exactly what is said um, on the um, when we send out the re-neighbor notifications. We're effectively inviting um, we're inviting further comment on the amended proposals. So the application, so that so what we have before us today wasn't a resubmission. It was merely rather it was an amendment. Um, so um, whilst Every objector has the, I think, that the right to withdraw their objections at any time. I don't think that uh, we, as as uh, as a service, actively, um, you know, sort of like say to objectors, you, objectors, you can withdraw your objections. Um, so I suppose that's all I could really okay. say so, on that. I think. Th thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. So what I'm seeing here is that potentially people could have withdrawn an objection. Um, seeing that there are quite significant changes to the application of what was originally proposed with the two dormers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that every, as far as I'm aware, certainly, and I don't know whether Daniel would be able to correct me on this, but um, I, I think that every object has got the, the right to withdraw their objection at any time. Um, but, um, but yes, I mean, it, that, that decision lies with them, whether they choose to make any further comment. Um, you know, I think five of the six objectors didn't make any further comments, neither did the community council, but clearly that given they didn't withdraw their objection, they must have still objected, even though it wasn't specifically in relation to the, the final set of proposals that we see before us. Yeah, thank you for that. I think we're maybe going around in a little bit in the circles, actually. I'm just, and maybe this is something to take up for the future or future applications. Um, should it be a similar situation in the sense that because these changes are quite big changes, it might be that they actually, those that were objecting, wouldn't actually object if they had actually realised that that is what they actually had to do. And maybe that's something that the convener and I can explore with Mrs Beattie just for complete transparency so that that's that was my first point so thank you for indulging me on th that um and uh, the next point i wanted to make is i would say that i'm pretty familiar with that area um uh, particularly that um, at the rear of those gardens there are a number of flatted properties that actually already look onto those gardens 
In fact, they might actually be offices. Mm. It's a very unusual layout at Queen's Mansion. Uh, I think collectively seeing Queen's Mansions, and you can actually access Queen's Mansions and go onto the lane. I don't know if there's actually a name for the lane technically that is behind the houses on Royf Road. I know they've had huge problems with um, not not Japanese not tweed, so that's why I was kind of familiar with the area there. But there are flats that or offices that actually already look onto those gardens. Is that correct? Just well, yeah, Royfold House um, is an office building which lies, yes, to the west, um, and it does lie directly behind the application site and and both, you know, neighbours immediately to the north and to the south. Um, so I guess that if they, they would, um, you know, from a from probably some of the top floors, they may well already have some views in into the application site and into um, the immediate adjacent neighbouring properties. <clears throat> no, but where I was coming from is that when the houses of Royfold were obviously built first and the Royfold house, as it's called, um, you know, privacy has been considered under this application, but perhaps privacy wasn't considered when Royfold house was built for those on Royfold um, Crescent. Yeah, I, I couldn't possibly comment on that. I, I didn't work for the council at the time. There would have been a different set of policies as well. Um, it looks like it's a building. 40, 50 years old, possibly. Um, maybe even I, I wouldn't think you were even anywhere near that. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I'm just, I'm just like the, like saying that. No, no, I wasn't. I wasn't inferring that you were around at that point. There was a privacy <laughs> it's just issue like you at that point. Comment on on whether that's you know it, it is what it is, isn't it? Unfortunately. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. As I say, I'm familiar with it because of the Japanese uh, not to weed and the issues I've dealt with uh, Kala previously. Um, and then just going to how the application looks now. So it's one dormer window, which seems to be quite tucked in to the existing buildings, how it looks. And then the the skylight. So that's not going to look, that won't affect number seven, a uh, number 11 at, at, at all. You know, you wouldn't be able really to look out of, of that. So there shouldn't be an impact at all. Yeah, well, as it's set out in the report, we've, you know, it's the evaluation set out into what the residential amenities it impacts on number seven and number 11. And, you know, we've tried to um, articulate the reason for basically saying it's an acceptable arrangement in terms of, you know, the impact on both neighbours' privacy. OK. I, I, I I think that's my, me done and uh, no, just for avoidance of doubt, no um, uh, uh, upset Mr Ledbetter in terms of age or anything like that. Nothing was intended at all here. Um, I'm not offended, don't worry. <coughs> Thanks, Camina. Okay, thank you, Councillor Stewart. Um, so I'm not seeing any other hands uh, or questions. Uh, with that said, I'll be moving the officer's recommendation, which is to approve unconditionally. The recommendation um, is, first of all, is anybody otherwise minded? Councillor Sure, I think that's a legacy hand you still got up. Do you want to pop it down in case? Yeah. So I'm not seeing anybody being otherwise minded. So again, just for completeness for the record, I'll just ask Ms. McBain just to go through around the committee to get now. Ms. McBain. Okay. Thank you, convener. So just for the record, and if you can just indicate that you're um, willing to approve the application as per the committee report. So convener? Approve. Vice convener? Approve. Councillor Avalon? Approve. Councillor Cook? Approve. Councillor Copeland? Approve. Councillor Cormie? Approve. Councillor Gregg? Approve. Councillor McKenzie? Approve. And Councillor Malik? Approved. OK, so the application is approved unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms McBain. OK, moving on to item 6.2, which is detailed planning permission for the change of use of land at the for the erection of a temporary chalet stroke mobile home at Bad's Farm, Angaston Road, Aberdeen. It's set out on pages 47 to 78. Planning reference is 201480. And we have the planning officer, Mrs Forbes. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I'll just share my presentation on, on the screen for you. Yeah. 
That's it. Thanks, James. OK. Um, so, um, good morning. Uh, th this application, which is item 6.2 on the agenda, is for a change of use of land for the erection of a temporary mobile home within a site located in the Green Belt, some three and a half kilometres to the northwest of Peter Cooter. The site lies, I'll just show you on the screen, the site lies to the east of Bads and of a group of houses known as Hillcrest Courtyard. It extends to an area of some 906 square metres and forms part of a wider area of uncultivated agricultural land extending to some 2.3 hectares. To the south of the application site are fields, whilst to the west is an unsurfaced track, which joins with a tarred single track private road accessed off the public road linking the A93 Peter Cooter to Bankery. <clears throat> There's a relatively lengthy planning history to the wider site, with planning permission originally having been granted in 2011 for the erection of a dwelling house, garage and associated stud farm. Conditions applied to the planning permission granted included restricting the occupancy of the dwelling house to a person employed full time in the stud farm business and the dependents, widow or widower of such a person, and the phasing of the development to ensure that the stables and associated infrastructure relating to the stud farm operation were constructed and brought into use prior to the commencement of the construction of the house and garage. Since planning permission was granted for the stud farm and the associated dwelling house, four applications have been submitted seeking removal of the condition restricting occupancy of the dwelling house. And most recently, an application was submitted in 2020 seeking a change of use of the land to a caravan site to allow for a residential mobile home to be located on the site for a period of up to five years. The application was refused at the Planning Development Management Committee in April 2020 and the decision appealed to the Scottish Ministers with the appeal being dismissed in July 2020 and planning permission refused. In outlining the reasons for the decision, the reporter acknowledged that there could be some practical and operational benefits in being able to live on site, but stated that until such time that the proposed stud farm was completed and had become operational, or until its operation was imminent, that the personal circumstances of the applicants could not be given weight in assessing whether the siting of a temporary caravan could be justified. At that time, the reporter found that the particular personal circumstances stated by the app appellant did not sufficiently justify the need for on-site accommodation. The current status of the site is that in recent months, works have been carried out, including the clearing of over overgrowth on site, the erection of fencing, the construction of the approved stables with associated infrastructure, the erection of formal entrances, including gate piers to the entrance of the stables and extensive drainage works across the site. Confirmation has also been received from Scottish Water that a mains water connection is now being completed to the site. This was carried out in April um, earlier this month. A planning statement submitted by the agents on behalf of the applicants and in support of this application states that the applicants since purchasing the site have established green pasture stud farm. The statement confirms that without on-site accommodation, the introduction of stud animals to the stables is impossible due to the nature of the business and the care that is required on site. The permission is therefore seeking a temporary mobile residential lodge on site for a period of 18 months for the house to be constructed and to allow the stud farm business to become fully established with the 24 hour supervision and care that's required for the stud farm uh, the stud horses. This application has been referred to Planning Development and Management Committee today as it has been the subject of 11 letters of objection and an objection from the Kutcher Community Council. In summary, the issues raised largely focus on the adverse impact of the proposal on the Green Belt, the absence of any real change in circumstance since the previous application was refused, the lack of evidence to suggest that on-site presence is necessary for the operation of a stud farm, the need for the original conditions to be retained and addressed, and the inappropriate nature of the proposed development for this site. All issues, <clears throat> excuse me, all issues are set out on pages 62 to 64 of the agenda and addressed within the report. In terms of statutory consultees, all comments are provided on pages 61 to 62 of the agenda, including, as outlined, those of the Community Council who objected to the proposal. 
The Council's roads and environmental teams raised no objection. <coughs> Excuse me. If the proposal were to be considered in isolation, then the proposed change of use to caravan site to allow for the temporary siting of a mobile home does not sit comfortably with the general principles of the Aberdeen City Local Development Plan. It doesn't comply with the Green Belt policy and therefore with the Scottish planning policy. However, the acceptability of this proposal needs to be considered in the context of the development which was granted conditional consent in, 20, in 2011 for the erection of a residential dwelling garage and associated stud farm at Bads. The current proposal is seeking a change of use of land for the erection of a temporary mobile home, which would provide the applicants with residential accommodation on site for a period of up to 18 months to allow for the approved stud farm to become fully operational as a business and also facilitate the construction of the dwelling house, which has consent and is directly associated with the stud farm operation. Since the 2020 application was determined and refused at committee last April, two determining factors have led us to now recommend the proposed change of use for approval. The first of these is the status of the stud farm, where the extent of works which have been carried out on site since the previous application was determined is such that the infrastructure is now in place um, to allow the stud farm to operate. And the second factor is the professional advice that has been provided by two expert bodies, namely the British Horse Society and the Scottish Rural College, both of whom support the, the view that 24 hour on site presence is indeed necessary for the operation of the stud farm in order to ensure that both animal welfare and security requirements are being adequately addressed. It is considered that suitably robust evidence has been provided and validated, which does demonstrate that the business operation of the approved stud farm is likely to be imminent. And that the current status of the stud farm is such that a 24 hour on site presence would now be required. It is therefore felt that there are material considerations which would carry sufficient weight and provide the justification required for the planning authority to support the application in this instance notwithstanding that the proposal may not address green belt policy requirements. And this position would align with that of the Scottish Government reporter's appeal decision and the specific reference which was made to the weight which could be given to welfare and security issues should the stud farm become operational or its operation become imminent. The recommendation is therefore for members to approve the change of use subject to a number of conditions as indicated within the report. The conditions include limiting the use of the caravan site to a single mobile home unit and the occupancy of that mobile home unit being restricted to a person employed full time in the stud farm. A condition has also been applied which would secure a time limit to the change of use to caravan site having to be implemented within six months of planning permission being granted and for that permission to then be limited to 18 months from the date the planning permission is initiated. And finally, a condition has been applied which would require removal of the mobile home unit at the end of that 18 month period and for the land to then be restored to its previous position. I'll take you through, I appreciate I've only shown you the site layout plans at the moment, and I'll take you through some of the, the photos that have been submitted, um, which show the, the level of infrastructure works that have been carried out on site. Um, I think that will show you perhaps the aerial photo of the site. Um, and going forward, the stable building, which is now being constructed with boundary treatment um, along the, the western boundary of the site. Here, the gate piers and access into the site, again, with the boundary treatment to the, to the east. Again, the stable buildings um, showing the paddock area adjoining the stable area. Here, showing fencing which has been erected within the paddocks um, and again access into the site both in terms of where the dwelling house would be constructed but also for the, the the stable buildings. Here more recent photos just within the last month again showing the stable building but also of the drainage um, infrastructure works that have been carried out on site and are now completed. Um, again I'm hoping that these photos are, are moving forward as I'm, as I'm speaking. Um, the, the completed stable building, um, surface water drainage, all drainage um, infrastructure complete. 
And the wider site and the drainage works that have been carried out within the wider site. Again, you'll see the, the, the fencing that has been that has been erected within the paddock area. And finally here, the infrastructure works in relation to the Scottish water connection to the mains water supply, which, as I say, was, was completed in the connection um, that was confirmed to us at the beginning of April. So that's my presentation finished. I'll take you back to the site layout plans. Um, and if you have any, any questions for me. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mrs. Forbes. That was very thorough to appreciate that. Um, Councillor Colney, I see your hands up for questions. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Convener. Uh, this application seems to have gone on for a, forever and a day, over many, many years. Uh, but there seems to be quite a lot of work being done since we, the last time we visited out there. Uh, is there anybody living in that house yet, Mrs. Forbes? Could you, could you, the house is attached to that. I mean, the it, it all not, seems to be. Sorry. The, the house has not been built. The the house is not um, under construction as yet. Um, the the condition applied to the 2011 consent um, required the delivery and the establishment of the 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 stud farm and for the stud farm to become operational before the house was yeah. constructed. Yeah. Okay. So. To have this operational, we need the, the mobile um, home up. All that seems to be, when we've been out there, there seems to be ponies there, but no stallions. So they obviously need this uh, uh, mobile home to, to have the thing uh, run as an agricultural business. Am I correct in saying that? Um, certainly that, um, having having sought the, the sort of expert um, advice of um, both the, the British Horse Society and um, a, a lecturer in, in equine business management and, and breeding units from, from the Scottish Rural College, um, their opinion was that um, on-site presence was indeed required um, for the, the stud farm. Um, whether that included um, stallions on site or not, um, their feeling was that the 24-hour supervision of horses um, was was um, a requirement. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Cormie. Councillor Greg. <clears throat> thank you. Um, there was mention um, within the representations uh, concerns uh, about the security and the integrity of the fencing. Um, I'm not sure if if that's particularly relevant for this application, which is about a temporary accommodation. But it, it would be useful to know a, a little more about the fencing, whether it's whether it's sufficient, whether it's considered sufficiently robust. Um, are, do we have any details on that? Because I think that I think that that is relevant because the temporary accommodation is there to um, make sure that the site is secure um, and the fencing is part of that. So any any feedback on the on the fencing? Um, certainly <clears throat> it was it was a concern that was raised in terms of um, safety safety um, implications potentially if if this the the fencing that has been erected was not um, sufficient. Um, that that is more in relation to the operation of the stud farm and the, and the requirements from a management of the stud farm um, aspect. Um, it's not something that we've considered in, in detail as part of this application. And certainly there is, um, you know, fencing which has been erected, which would appear appropriate in terms of livestock, um, which has been erected within the, within the site. And and obviously, I, I don't know whether you can see on on the the screen there. Um, which in, in, encloses both the area where the, sta the stabling is, but also um, where the paddock area is. Um, and it would be expected, certainly, in terms of the operation and the management of the stud farm, that they would erect um, fencing, which would be suitable to, to, to um, retain the, 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 the animals within their, within their site. Yeah. Exactly. We would, no yeah. We would not have any reason to to question that that in terms of what they've what they've put in place is not appropriate. Great, thank you. Any thanks? Okay, um, 
Any other questions before I ask a few? No? Okay. Um, <coughs> Mrs. Forbes, you obviously made reference to, um, and I've, I've seen it, the, the uh, comments from the British Horse Society and also the Scottish, Scottish Rural College. Can you just verify, I mean, it, it, it does indicate in the, the emails that these were um, solicited, I suppose, independently of the applicant. They were done by ourselves to ensure that we had sufficient evidence. Um, it's just so that because in the community council's um, representation, it talks about letters uh, that residents make reference to, but we don't have in our packs. We're, no. It's got contrary. So I think what we have to deal with is what you've got. And that you know it has been independently sought rather than it being provided to us. No, it, it, that that is the that is the case. We were obviously aware the there were um, concerns raised in terms of um, whether there was a requirement for the twenty four hour on site presence in relation to um, the operation of the stud farm, and certainly in, in a number of the objections, um, that requirement for on-site presence was questioned and there was reference to um, advice having been sought from the British Horse Society on that basis. Um, therefore felt it was it was necessary from our, our point of view to, to seek independent advice of both the British Horse Society and we also sought um, advice from um, the um, Scottish Rural College and specifically from a, a lecturer who um, lectures in equine business management and breeding units and with an experience of 20, some 25 years in lecturing, um, mainly on the, on the basis that we wanted to, to, to get their opinions on the requirement for that 24 hour on site um, supervision um, and what the implications would be if that was not um, possible to, to deliver and certainly their, their response came back um that in their opinion um there was indeed a requirement for you know if breeding was taking place on the stud farm that the staff or proprietors needed to be there um on a 24 hour um basis for foaling or for um the the, the stallions um and they felt that the the supporting information that had been provided by the applicant um in terms of the essential requirement was indeed sounded accurate from from their point of view. Um, they also felt that from an insurance point of view, there was a requirement um, for that twenty four hour on site presence, um, and that was also something which had been had been questioned in terms of the objections received. So we we wanted clarity on that, and as you say, to seek independent advice. And we felt that the 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 two expert bodies that we approached um, provided sufficient. Um, um, advice on 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 the aspects that we had we had sought and and which had been raised by the objectors can i also now if we could just um talk about the fact that we're it's the change of land um used to caravan site which um certainly seems to have raised quite a lot of alarm bells um can, can, I, can i just kind of go into that element a little bit more um, obviously, in the, the conditions we, we've stated in condition uh, two, that it'll only be uh, limited to one caravan stroke mobile stroke chalet home at any one time. Um, uh, and my understanding, again, from the, the red line that we've drawn around it, that you wouldn't be able to actually fit any more than one on that particular footprint. And it's only that part of the footprint that's been designated for the caravan site if you like i think i think the word site perhaps is uh, has caused concern amongst uh, some people could you maybe just give me a little bit around that please mrs forbes yes certainly um i mean the the, the area of land which which relates to this application site is um 906 square meters um and yes the 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 potential for any more than one um mobile home caravan to be located within that that site area um, is, is particularly limited on that basis. Um, certainly the, the change of use, um, you know, the application is for a change of use. Um, it, it's not about the, 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 the physical development, if you like, and the, 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 the change of use to caravan site would allow for um, that, that caravan, to, to, uh, caravan to be located within the site. Um, the, the caravan licensing um, legislation um, then controls 
um, the, the, the caravan on the site. Um, if you like planning, the planning application grants the use for a caravan site um, with the Caravan Sites and Control of Development Act then um, granting the, the permission for the, the, the mobile home unit itself. Um, with the control of the, the, the period of um, change of use being limited to 18 months, it does mean that um, if the licence is granted for the, the, the caravan on that site, um, when the planning permission expires, the licence will no longer um, stand. Therefore, the, the planning permission itself does um, limit the use of that land um, for the, the, the caravan site. Um, and whilst it is a different, um, there are, there's different legislation for the, the caravan site itself, um, it requires planning permission to be in place for um, a licence to be granted. And once that planning permission expires, there would be no longer permission for the caravan site on that on that land. No, that, that's really helpful, um, Mrs Forbes, because as I say, I think there, there was a concern that once it was designated as a caravan site, that it would suddenly the whole area would turn into a potential caravan uh, site. And, and I think there's genuine concern as well in the area um, that, you know, we've previously um, approved for stud farms and unfortunately we didn't have the condition where the stud farm was delivered first and we allowed the house to be delivered first Funnily enough, the stud farm never came. So this is why I think there's a number of objections and concerns being raised. And I yeah. think that the way we've laid out the conditions um, doesn't undermine the conditions of the previous um, application, um, but um, tightens up the conditions on the specific use of that small footprint for one mobile home for a limited period. Is that my, am I right <laughs> understanding? Yes. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, I've given this application a huge amount of thought because of uh, of the number of objections and obviously the fact that, you know, what was in essence looked like the same application just with a shorter time frame, which was refused and upheld by the, the um, reporter last time, suddenly appearing to be being approved. But I think we've heard from Mrs Forbes the reason why, and that's because we've been given evidence by professional bodies. It's a bit of a chicken and egg. And until we can get the, um, them on site, they can't start their business. And until they start their business, they probably can't get the money to build the house. So I think the, the combination effect um, has kind of created the situation that we, we face ourselves. But I'll move the officer's recommendation to approve it with the conditions, which um, for me um, is kind of the crucial part. And the conditions are laid out on page 76 to 77. There's five of them. The final, the fifth condition having um, six parts to it. Now this does restrict um, any misuse of that site, turning it into some sort of caravan park. It restricts it for from six months from the date of, of notice started and 18 months following that for it being on site. Um, now, I've been reassured by officers that we have the power to take enforcement action if necessary. Um, and following the, the, the temporary use of the, the caravan, it will have to be then returned back to its original status um, and will no longer cease to hold the, the, the status of caravan site. Is anybody otherwise minded? No? OK. Brent, that application, Miss McBain, could you just go to the, the, the verbal vote, please? OK, thank you, convener. So if members can just indicate that they're willing to approve the application as per their officer's recommendation. So convener? Yeah, approve conditionally. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Vice convener? Approve conditionally. Councillor Allen? Approve. Councillor Cook? Approve. Councillor Copeland? Approve. Councillor Gregg? Approve. Councillor Mackenzie? Councillor Mackenzie, you're on mute. I'll come back. And Councillor Malik? Approve. You forgot me, Lindsay. Sorry, Councillor Cormie. Approve. Thank you. And Councillor Mackenzie? Approve. OK, thank you. So the application is approved unanimously with the conditions in the committee report. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Ms. McBain. Right, moving on to item 6.3, which is detailed planning permission for the installation of the entrance gates and CCTV camera at Stonywood House, Stonywood Park, Aberdeen. It's on pages 79 to 96. And I've lost my, it's just gone off my screen. Sorry, it's Mrs. Green, thank you. Thank you, good morning. Um, I will just share my presentation. Okay, can you see that? Fine, thank you, Susan. There. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, this is a planning application for the erection of the entrance gates on the drive to Stonywood House, as well as for the CCTV camera on the house, which is one of six. So the site plan shows the application site boundary, um, quite a large red line boundary covering Stonywood House and its grounds, the house being here, um, and the entrance gates subject of the application would be down here. So this is an image taken from the council's GIS system um, and I've indicated the rough location of the gates on it and the CCTV camera on the end of the house. Um, and you can see that the gates would be located on the drive close to its junction with Petrie Way. And Stonywood Terrace lies just to the south along here. Uh, and that's the road that leads to the Stonywood paper mill. So this is an elevation of the gates with the gate posts at just over two metres in height and the gates themselves, which would slide to each side on guide tracks. So that's a plan view of the gates and also shows the intercom, which would be located just to the south of the gates. This photograph was submitted by the applicant and shows the driveway at its junction with Petrie Way. Now the gates would be located approximately 10 metres from the junction, so from, from this point. So it's, a, it's approximately here where the drive is still wide. This is just showing the location of the CCTV camera that, that needs planning permission. Obviously, that all six have already got listed building consent at um, the last committee. Um, an image of the CCTV camera and then a photograph of the front elevation of the house just located indicating where the camera would go on the end elevation there. It's not actually on the front elevation, it's just around on the side. Elevation showing the camera there on the end. So turning to the report and evaluation, I'll just go back to the this. Um, as is noted, the proposal originally included deer and security fences that encircled the site with a length of wall across the southwest side of the gate of the site with gates. Um, with the proposal now having been scaled back to propose only the gates as well as the CT CCTV camera. There's been an objection from the Community Council and objections from 31 people whilst the applicant has submitted a letter of support. The objections relate to matters including access and highlight how members of the public walk through the grounds for recreation, including to access the Riverside path. Um, they raise the impact of the proposals on amenity, including visual and residential amenity and the setting of the listed Stonywood House and listed lodge to the south. In doing this, objections refer to the Stonywood master plan and to policies in the local plan relating to access and recreation, as well as the Land Reform Act. The applicant describes the reasons for requiring additional security and points to the Stonywood 
master plan stating that the original proposals were for the house to be converted to flats and that there's an extensive network of paths outside the grounds of Stonywood House, including the core path which runs along Petrie Way. In determining the application, the matters for consideration are whether the proposal would cause disruption to the green space network, access for people as well as access for wildlife, visual appearance of the gates and the cameras. The report describes how the proposals would not be out of keeping with the surrounding area in terms of their appearance and would have an insignificant impact on the setting of the listed buildings. With regard to trees, it's noted that the locations of trees and their root protection areas is not on the drawings. However, given the nature of the site and the possibility of adjusting slightly the location of the gateposts, it's considered reasonable to require this information by condition. In terms of access, the gates would control access along the surface driveway from Petri Way. Elsewhere, access to the grounds would be unaffected by the proposals, with there being a path through from the north and from the riverside up the bank to the east of the house. So the people would also be able to walk around the sides of the gates, um, although they'd be walking on the grass doing that. So the existing situation in Stonywood house grounds is that people wander through the grounds on a combination of worn paths, grass, the surface driveway and the rough path down to the river. So I'll just move on to the Stonywood master plan. This is quite a blurry slide, but um, this is taken from the accessibility section of the master plan and the layout in this area of the site has changed a little bit so that this is the core path. Um, it's actually located along Petri Way further to the west. Um, and the house which was envisaged to be converted to flats, obviously that hasn't happened either. So very faintly you can see um, that this route's indicated as the intention was to have um, an informal path proposed part of the proposed network that would go down to the river um, and there's a path behind the house there that that links up with that so um i've had sight of the representation that was sent to councillors um and i can provide some additional information in respect of that i'll just stop sharing Um, so that it mentioned rights of way um, and talked about these having been concluded, 50 years use having been concluded, but um, there were discussions about a right of way, not in respect of this planning application, but um, some time ago and 50 years use was not concluded by the council. There was some evidence gathering um, in 2016, which related to the route behind the house towards the river. Um, and it didn't appear to provide sufficient evidence to assert a right of way. Um, but in, at the same time, the route was kept open by the landowner, allowing public usage at that time. Um, so that's just to cover that point. Um, with regard to access for pedestrians around the sides of the gates. Um, I'd also recommend that we add in a section to the condition about the trees that would specifically seek details of that, that an accessible route around the side of the gate. Um, and I've, I've got some wording for that, um, which I can share. It's not there yet, let's see. Yet. You see that now? Um, coming up, coming yeah. Up, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I've just added part D, which says details including a plan showing an accessible route to the side of the gates suitable for use by wheelchairs and pushchairs. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so just in conclusion, um, the proposal to erect the gates was considered to balance the needs of the applicant with regards to security with continued access to the grounds and the proposal is recommended for approval. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mrs. Green. <coughs> Could you just pop your screen down and put your mic on mute because we're getting feedback from each other, I think. Please. Oh. Okay, thank you. Questions from Mrs. Green? I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, sorry, Councillor Greg. And then yeah. we've, we've had a flurry there. <laughs> Councillor Greg first. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that was really helpful to see that additional condition D. Um, would the applicant consider that to be acceptable, um, given that the, the, the proposal that we have before us is to deal with security? So w would they have concerns that security or safety was being compromised by that side accessible route? Um, well, I can't confirm what the applicant would say to that, but um, obviously for able-bodied people, the site, as a result of this application anyway, would remain open. Yeah. So it would only be vehicles that would stop be stopped from going through the gates. Yeah. It's possible to walk into the site from various other points or around the gates. Um, it was just to ensure that there was um, a route that wheelchairs and pushchairs could take around the gates. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a that's a welcome and positive extra condition. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Greg. Councillor Cook. Thank you, convener. Again, it's a, it's a related matter on the uh, on the proposed condition um, D there. Um, just in terms of the um, the size of any gap to allow a push chair or um, a, a wheelchair through. Um, if you've got um, a, a cycle gate that you can get a cycle through, they can be wide enough for a wheelchair user, but occasionally they can be too small for someone on a bike who's got one of those kiddie trailers behind. Um, I'm wondering if, if there's some way of um, putting in some words on, on that so that it, it, um, it, it will be accessible to someone on a bike pu uh, pulling one of the kiddie trailers. Councillor Cook, you've obviously not had to push a twin buggy. It's it, it's even wider, trust me. Uh, Mrs Green, I think probably part of the condition asks them to provide the details so that you could be able to deal with it. Yes, Thanks. I mean that, that, that's fine. Yeah, I wasn't. I was envisaging that there would just be a gap that was level rather than a any sort of gate. But we can look at that when the details come in. Fine. Thanks, Councillor Cook. Councillor Copeland. Sorry, you can read up. I mean, I looked at the pictures of the building where the CCTV camera was going to be placed. What's it pointing to? Is it pointing up that that made up road or what's it actually pointing towards? Yeah, it's pointing northwards, but just let me pull the slide up. Yeah, it's that one sort of pointing northwest. So there's a path from this direction, there's a route in. Um, although from that arrow, it's not exactly pointing in that direction, but that could just be a um, an approximation of where it's intended to point. So it's pointing towards the northwest. Am I so can I defer? Am I right in thinking that when we gave permission for the other CCTV cameras, we refused that one for some reason? No, they were all approved. 
right. listed building consent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Copeland. Any other questions? Okay. Can I get you to drop your screen, Lucy? Thanks. Not that I really want to look at myself, but. <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. Um, OK, so we have the recommendations of uh, um, approve conditionally and we've added the extra one, read the accessibility at um, an item D. Um, I'll be moving the recommendations and I think, as Councillor Greg mentioned, I think we're, we're all feeling a lot happier that accessibility will be maintained, particularly for people in, in wheelchairs and um, mums with with push chairs and even people with bikes with the, the trailer, kids buggy trailer or whatever it's called in the back. Um, so with that, are we happy to, well, content to approve? Right, okay, there's nobody showing anything otherwise. Um, Mrs. McBain, could you just go again to a verbal uh, vote, please? No problem, thank you, convener. So if you can just indicate again that you're um, willing to approve the application as per the conditions with the extra condition at part D. So convener? Approve. Thank you. Uh, Vice convener. Approve. Councillor Allen. Approve. Councillor Cook. Approve. Councillor Copeland. Approve. Councillor Cormie. Approve. Councillor Gregg. Approve. Councillor Mackenzie. Approve. And Councillor Malik. Approve. Okay, thank you. So the application is approved unanimously. Okay, thanks very much. Moving swiftly on to 6.4, which is detailed planning permission for the change of use from class three food and drink to a hot food takeaway um, and installation of a, um, an extractor duck at 81 Charleston Road, North Aberdeen, on pages 97 to 128, planning reference 200599. And we have the planning officer, Mr. Ferguson. Alex. Convener, sorry, can I just interrupt ah. one second? Um, Councillor Houghton is just going to come online to replace Councillor Stewart, so I thought maybe this was a good point before we start the application, if that's OK. Um, is, does that suit you yourself, Councillor Stewart? Because I know you've got a, 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 a private appoint a pre previous appointment, to get the words out. It was just um, in case the application ran over. Yeah, if, um, thank you, convener. It's a hospital appointment I have to attend. Um, I, I would have to leave at quarter two, but I'm minded that if it runs on and I wouldn't want to any discussion that either I couldn't vote so if Councillor Houghton steps in at this point then the then full cognizance can be given to the planning application. That's great thank you Councillor okay. Stewart so welcome okay. Councillor Houghton. Thank um, you so I'll shall I just leave the meeting then or yeah, don't? Yeah okay you can leave now Councillor Stewart that'll be fine okay. thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much thank, thank you. you. So Councillor Houghton is now online so if you <coughs> can proceed. OK, thank you. Carry on, sorry. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Perfect. That's OK. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Good morning, councillors. Um, can you see my screen OK? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. <clears throat> um, this application seeks detailed planning permission to change the use of the cafe premises at 81 Charleston Road North in Cove to a hot food takeaway, um, which the applicant would operate as a fish and chip shop. Um, in terms of the location of the site, the existing cafe premises is situated on Charleston Road North at the western edge of Cove near to Wellington Road. Um, the unit lies on the northern side of the street on the corner of the junction with Langdykes Avenue. The application site forms part of a terrace containing commercial uses at ground floor with residential flats above. Um, housing and a car parking courtyard lie to the north. Um, with further housing beyond to the south and east. Um, between the site and Wellington Road are further buildings with commercial uses at ground floor um, and flats on the upper floors with car parking behind. Um, as you can see from this image, the cafe occupies part of the ground floor level with flats above. Um, further, commercial, further commercial units lie to the west with Sainsbury's in the buff coloured building at the end of the street. Um, this image shows the view looking north from Charleston Road North along Langdykes Avenue. And as you can see, the unit has a frontage onto both streets um, with the entrance door on the corner. 
Um, this slide shows a few images of the unit's single storey flat roofed rear extension from a few different angles. The top left image shows the extension from Langdykes Avenue, um, and the other two images show the extension when viewed from the adjacent residence car parking courtyard to the north. Um, the right hand side image shows the location of a rear entrance door um, which serves the flats upstairs. Um, the rear extension of the building contains the kitchen and back of house areas um, for the cafe. Um, this image just shows some of the dedicated visitor car parking available to members of the public um, situated behind the Sainsbury's retail unit, um, which is approximately 85 metres to the northwest of the application site. In terms of land use zoning in the adopted uh, local development plan, the site forms part of a much wider residential area that covers the majority of Cove. <coughs> Um, the residential zoning remains the same in the proposed local development plan as well. <coughs> um, this slide shows the proposed internal floor plan uh, layout for the fish and chip shop. There would be a customer waiting area with some seating to the front, um, with the sales area in the centre and the kitchen and back of house areas positioned in the extension to the rear. Um, you can also see on this plan the proposed routing of a kitchen extract duct, um, which would flew up through the roof directly above the kitchen area before running along uh, the top of the roof uh, of the rear extension and terminating uh, towards the end of the, the rear extension. And in terms of alterations to the exterior of the building, the only works proposed involve the installation of the kitchen extract duct um, that would be mount mounted on the roof. Um, the extension has a 400 millimeter high parapet uh, to its northeastern and northwestern walls, um, which would uh, ensure that the 500 millimeter high duct um, would not be prominently visible from ground level. Um, the slide also shows a, a bit clearer the distance between the rear windows of the upstairs flats um, and the termination point of the of the duct. <clears throat> um, in terms of waste storage, this slide shows the, the location of the communal bin store area for the commercial and residential units uh, to the rear of the building in blue and the application site in red. In terms of representations received, a total of 411 were received, the vast majority of which were supportive of the application um, with seven objections submitted, which is the reason why um, we're, um, it's come to committee today. Um, those who wrote in support of the application generally noted that the takeaway would be an excellent addition to the local community and would add choice in terms of the takeaway offering in Cove. Um, they also noted that the takeaway would be um, sustainably, uh, sorry, accessed, could be accessed sustainably, um, being within walking distance for many. Um, several, several respondents also mentioned that at present they drive well beyond the Cove area to get fish and chips. Um, other reasons for supporting the application included the creation of jobs, the filling of a vacant commercial unit and the adequate provision of car parking nearby. In terms of the seven objections received, a number of issues and concerns were raised, um, all of which are detailed in the committee report, but the main issues are briefly highlighted on this slide. Um, the main points raised include a lack of car parking in the area, um, detriment to road and pedestrian safety, um, the use would lead to an increase in antisocial behaviour and littering, um, there would be a detrimental impact on residential amenity due to noise and odour emissions, and that a takeaway would be inappropriate in a residential area. Um, in terms of the uh, kitchen extract system, um, it should be noted that the plans have been amended since the original submission with the kitchen extract duct now proposed to flow through the roof and terminate on the roof of the extension as per the, pl the plans on the previous slides, um, thus avoiding any ri risk to members of the public. Um, in terms of concerns about litter outside the premises, it should also be noted that an amended waste management plan has been submitted by the applicant 
and it is now proposed that they would place a litter bin on the pavement immediately outside the premises during operational hour operational hours, which could be used by customers. Um, with regard to consultation responses, the council's roads, ma roads development management team do not object, um, noting the sufficient availability of car parking for customers nearby. Um, environmental health initially had concerns regarding the potential for noise and odour emissions from the kitchen extraction system um, to cause harm to the, the amenity of the flats above. <clears throat> However, Following the submission of noise and odour assessments, which uh, recommended the installation of the extract duct shown on the previous slides, um, environmental health are satisfied that subject to the implementation of the extract duct and all other mitigation measures recommended in the assessments, the proposed use would not cause harm to the amenity of any neighbouring properties. Um, the Cove and Alton's Community Council do not object to the application, but did raise several matters that they wish to be taken into consideration, the majority of which were also raised by objectors. Um, these matters are addressed in the report of handling. Um, to summarise, uh, the Planning Service considers that subject to the conditions on page 125 of the committee agenda pack, um, the proposed use, the proposed change of use of the unit to a hot food takeaway um, would not cause harm to either the character or amenity of the residential uh, of the residential area, and the application is therefore recommended for approval. Thanks for listening. Um, happy to answer any questions, and I'll, get, and I'll take this down as soon as I can. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, um, could I get you to put your mic off, Alex? Because that will thanks. Perfect. Um, questions for Mr. Ferguson. I've all, Ms., uh, Councillor Greg. I've also got um, Mr. Glover from Environmental Health here as well. So if you've got a question for him, yeah. Councillor Greg. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, I have um, a question about the ex extraction system. Um, I think it would be useful just to hear again maybe in more detail what this changes. Um, there were concerns expressed that the um, flu would exit onto residential um, spaces. So am I hearing that it's going, that that the um, exit is now on the roof? Uh, because that, that's quite important. And maybe related to that, what what is the stop the clock? Um, what's the, the significance of the stop the clock um, section? I think that's related to to the to the management of odor. Yes, yes. So on the first question, yeah. Um, if I can just share my screen with you again, uh, and I'll show you the plan. Um, so can you see that? Oh, here it goes. Yeah. yeah. So this is um, this is a plan showing from. If you recall from the, the site photo I showed, there was um, a door to the uh, serving the flats upstairs mm -hmm. to the rear. So that's in here on floor plan. This is the back of house area for the, the, um, the takeaway. And the existing, so that, that shows you the, the entrance door. So there's a little pedestrian corridor effectively um, that takes you down to the, to the back of the flats. Um, now, this image shows, so initially it was proposed to reuse the existing extract duct on the on the wall that faces right onto the, um, the, the pedestrian channel effectively to that rear entry door. Um, and following the submission of noise and odour impact assessments, it was decided that actually um, it would be necessary to, to put a new duct in, which is now what's been proposed in the amended plans. So rather than reusing the existing extract duct, which was where the concern came with kind of fumes um, spilling out at head height onto pedestrian um, walkway, um, the, the duct is now proposed to flew out directly up through the roof and then terminate um, to the to, at the end of the rear extension. Um, so that shows you the routing there, if you can see my cursor. Um, in terms of uh, stop the clock, um, that's purely a procedural matter. So that's um, 
we have a target determination uh, deadline of, of two of two months for planning applications um, because it took the applicant longer than that to submit their noise and odor um, assessments um, we, we were effectively able to stop the clock on on the application time period um, until that information was submitted so that's um, purely a procedural matter that, thank you um, I think I think that that's a welcome um, improvement but nevertheless it, it, it's still possible uh, I'm, I know that the extraction systems are highly highly effective these days but what but what happens if there's a fault or or, or an issue um, would would it, would it be monitoring um, is there a method for complaining so that it can be inspected and, and followed up what I could do, Mr. Ferguson, is I'll maybe take in Mr. Um, Glover because it's yeah. going to be his his area that will pick it up, Mr. Thank Glover. You. Hello, convener. Thank you. Yeah, it it would come down to management of the system. So, um, if a resident's impacted by the smell due to a fault, they could just go to the the rest the, the, the takeaway and let them know. Or equally, they could come to us and notify us, and at that point, we could uh, look into why uh, all of a sudden it's causing an issue. Okay. Great. Thank you. All done. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Grant. Has anyone else got any questions? No. Can I? Can I just have a follow up? It's it's really on the the kind of the smells um, that I have concerns. Um, I've got a number of takeaway uh, premises in my area and I can usually decide which one by the smell out the door. But <laughs> so I know that the, the, these extractor fans and systems are you know, improving all the time. Um, in terms of, and this, you know, I'm not technically specialist um, in this, but, you know, in terms of wind, blue and everything else, how, I, I don't really understand exactly how the, the smells will be uh, dealt with through this extractor fan. Mr Glover, do you have a little bit more detail in terms of do they just still spew out the smells or, or how does it actually operate? Yes, convener. So um, it, it, it depends what you, you're extracting. So there, there is national guidance on looking at um, ensuring that the design of the extract system is suitable for um, what what it's trying to extract and what impact that would have on the surrounding area and then depending on depending on those inputs into that assessment um, that would uh, determine the degree of controls necessary to be built in so there's not always um, what, what one extraction system doesn't fit all. It's it could almost be unique for each in occasion. And then um, yet there is a selection of different types of way of dealing with the, almost the pollutants that are being extracted in the smell. So you can have things um, like grease traps. So it it speeds up and slows down the flow of the air through the system to cause heavier particles like grease and that to fall out or be trapped and it can go through other things like carbon filters to capture the smell um, but th th these all things require maintenance so there would be a management element to it over time but that that's the the, the thrust of how they how they operate if that if that helps. OK, so I mean, but you, you've seen obviously the detail of the one being proposed for here uh, mm. and you're content um, that, that that was sufficient. And if, for instance, they, they're not maintaining it and smells start, there is a mechanism through your legislation to intervene in terms of going into it. Yes, so the, 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 the assessment submitted was in line with the, the national guidance and the controls recommended are appropriate to the, the the situation that the application is is in and um yeah it should 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 management fail um to control or maintain the system 
there is there is um, legislation that we can use to um, require to that, that to be addressed. OK, that's helpful, Mr. Glover. I mean, I'm just conscious it's a very different type of premises that's there at the moment. A little coffee shop compared to a fish and chip shop will give obviously slightly different odours, shall we say? Indeed, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, that's fine. As, and have we got any other questions? No. OK, right. The recommendation is one of approval. Um, uh, conditionally, the conditions are set out on pages 125 to 126. Um, and there's also an advisory note on 126 to 127. So with that, um, is anybody otherwise minded? I'm not seeing any alternative moves. So I'll move the recommendations. Um, Mrs McBain, could you go to the, the verbal vote, please? <clears throat> Thank you, convener. So just once again, I'll just run through everybody and just indicate that you're happy to approve the application conditionally. So convener. Agreed. Councillor Houghton. Agreed. Councillor Allen. Agreed. Councillor Cook. Approve. Councillor Copeland. Approve. Councillor Cormie. Approve. Councillor Gregg. Approve. Councillor McKenzie. Approve. Councillor Malik. Approved. OK, thank you. So the application is approved unanimously. OK, again, thank you very much, Mrs McBain. Um, we're now moving on to the area where the recommendation is one of refusal. Um, and I'll just tell you now so that um, you'll be prepared. Item 7.2, which is the Chester Hotel, has been withdrawn by, entirely by the applicant. So we only have one item under this section, which is 7.1, which is the detailed planning permission for the erection of four residential units, three apartments and one house with associated works at 19 South Avenue, Aberdeen. It's set out on pages 129 to 154. The planning reference is 201630 and our planning officer is uh, Denise Frazier. Over to you. Good morning, convener. Can you see the screen? All right. And perfect. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Good. Right, so this application is for the construction of four residential units split into a block of three flats and a single detached dwelling at 19 South Avenue in Colts. The site's located on the corner of South Avenue and North Deeside Road. Um, and it was previously occupied by a single detached one and a half storey dwelling, which was demolished in 2014. Um, an original boundary wall surrounding the site along its boundaries with North Deeside Road and South Avenue was also demolished by the applicant under permitted development rights. The site has a long planning history. Um, in 2014, planning permission was granted for a substantial single detached dwelling, which was not implemented, and this permission has now lapsed. Um, this application was followed by three further applications in 2016, 2018 and 2020, all for four residential units, either as a single block containing four flats or for four detached dwellings. All three applications were refused by planning committee with the two last ones also dismissed on appeal. In relation to this current proposal, the Colts, Bealside and Mill Timber Community Council lodged an objection and a total of 26 members of the public objected to the scheme, uh, objected to the scheme across two rounds of neighbour notification. All matters raised are set out in the report and can be found on pages 140, 141 and 142 of the agenda pack. Material considerations raised can be summarised under the following categories. One, impact on the character and appearance of the surrounding area. Two, design. Three, impact on residential amenity, both of neighbouring properties and of future residents. And four, impact on local highway conditions. There were no objections from colleagues in roads development management or environmental health. Um, as with the previous applications, the site context is an important element to assess the impact of the proposal on the character of the surrounding area. The location plan shows the site outlined in red, if you can see my cursor. Um, it's on the corner of North Deeside Road and South Avenue. This drawing further shows that the general surrounding area is characterised by detached and semi-detached dwellings sitting centrally within their plot and leaving a generous distance of both the front and the back boundaries. Importantly, it also shows that there's a clear break in the density um, of the surrounding area, with South Avenue, which runs here, and the Access Intercourt's Court forming a boundary between lower density to the west and generally to the south as well, 
and a more higher density related to the center of gulfs to the east. This can also be seen in the aerial photograph, which again shows the site outlined in red with Colts Court here and number 21 South Avenue down there. The site plan um, shows that the proposed element would consist of two separate buildings. So there's a flatted block in the northern half of the site with three units and a further detached single dwelling in the southern half of the site, which would face east onto South Avenue. Similar to the previous application, a triangular area in the south corner um, provides vehicular access to 21 South Avenue. Um, this area has been removed from the, the overall developable site area, which was consistent with the view of the inspector who dealt with the previous appeal. A further area has been removed in relation to this new application, which is located here, where the applicant has indicated um, that this area could be used to widen the junction from South Avenue onto North Deset Road. Taking away these two areas, the overall density of the proposed development site would sit at 35%. And when looking at the individual plots, this figure will be about 39% for the detached dwelling and about 31% for the block of flats. These figures um, would be artificially high when compared to the surrounding area, where the vast majority of dwellings have a much lower density. So for example, um, the neighbouring dwelling at number 21 um, has a density of about 14%. So taking consideration of the character of the surrounding area, it is considered that the proposed density is too high for this particular site and would have a detrimental impact on the character and appearance of the surrounding area. The overdevelopment of the site is further reflected in several elements of the site layout, especially to the front of the flats here, which would be dominated by a parking court with only a very limited strip of landscaping immediately adjacent to North Deeside Road and to the rear of this block as well, where um, the external amenity space serving the residents will be very limited. So there'll be a small garden for this flat and a small section of, of open of open space here for the ground floor flat on this site. Um, it could also be seen in the very limited distance between the front of the dwelling here to South Avenue, where there's about a metre separating the front elevation to the road and a very limited depth of the garden, especially when you're looking at the projection um, from the dwelling to the boundary to 21 South Avenue. This again will be in contrast with the dominating character of the surrounding area, which is set by dwellings located centrally within their plot with generous gardens to the front and the back. Just a second. Now, if we're going to the design of the buildings, the proposed elevations, so these are the ones for the flats and these are the ones for the houses, show that a modern design is proposed for both buildings. Um, similar materials are proposed. So there's timber linings and granite. Both would have a monopitched roof design, um, which will be clad in um, dark grey metal sheeting. Even though it is considered that a modern design could be acceptable in this location, it is considered that this current proposal does not take sufficient consideration of the site context and includes further indications that the proposal would not fit comfortably on the site. In particular, the north of the east elevation of the um, block of flats will be um, dominating and be quite harsh because it's so blank. Um, it would be an over, have an overbearing impact on the surrounding area, especially given that um, this building would sit above road level. So what you can see on this cross section is here. This black line is the level of South Avenue as it kind of goes down from North Deeside Road towards a, the entrance to 21 South Avenue. And the applicant is proposing to create two artificial platforms. So this building will be sitting above um, street level, which will make it even more dominating over South Avenue. It is also very clearly visible when you're driving down from North Deeside Road towards the west. Um, it is also considered that the proposed block of flats will be overbearing on the proposed dwelling. So again, when you look at the cross section, this is further emphasized through the change in levels and again, the use of the artificial platforms. So the larger, taller building will be located on quite a significant higher level than the smaller, lower single dwelling. 
and this would result in an unacceptable relationship between these two dwellings on the site and it would demonstrate that the site as a whole would not present a coherent appearance and design value and this again is considered to have a negative impact on the character and appearance of the surrounding area. So finally, in relation to the impact of the proposal on the residential amenity of neighbouring properties, the detached dwelling would have a number of west facing. Um, yes, yeah, this one would have a number of west facing windows that would be directed towards a private rear garden and rear elevation of the neighbouring property at 21 South Avenue. I can probably best show this on the site plan. So there will be windows located here and here roughly looking out towards this area here and back towards the rear elevation of this dwelling. And um, also the additional bulk and volume of development along the east boundary of number 21. Again, as you can see here along on this site plan um, and the limited depth of the rear garden serving the detached dwelling would mean that this dwelling will be artificial close to the boundary with number 21 and it is considered to have an overbearing impact on the residential amenity of this neighbouring property to the detriment of their residential amenity. It is for these reasons set out above, I've set out earlier and detailed in the committee report on pages 152 and 153 of today's agenda pack that the application is recommended for refusal. So are there any questions? Thanks very much, uh, Annika. Um, I'll just make sure you pop your screen down. Any questions for Ms. Brazier? No? Okay. I've just got one actually. Um, uh, as you gave us the history, there's been a you know a number of attempts. Uh, they do have one approval for a single house, uh, but they, they keep coming back. Do they come in for a pre-application forum, you know, on this site? Um, generally, before they submit a planning application, they come in for pre-application advice as well, yes. Yes, yeah, so they, they've had advice on this site as well, I'm just, I suppose I'm asking you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll be moving the officer's recommendation. I think uh, Ms. Brazier has given us a, a, a full <laughs> overview of the site um, and, and, you know, knowing that area very well. Uh, the, the South Avenue, which there's is actually used heavily by footfall in terms of people going to the, the doctor's surgery, which is on South Avenue, because there's actually quite insufficient pavements around there. So um, to use that um, as a vehicular access, a main vehicular access would actually be hugely detrimental for footfall. Um, so with that, I'll be moving. Is there anybody otherwise minded? No. Nope. Okay, again, Mrs McBain, could I just get you to do the, the verbal vote, please? No problem. Thank you, convener. So members can just indicate that they're willing to refuse the application. Um, so, convener, refuse. Councillor Houghton, refuse. Councillor Allen, refuse. Councillor Cook, refuse. Councillor Copeland, refuse. Councillor Cormie, refuse. Councillor Gregg, refuse. Councillor McKenzie, Councillor McKenzie, so frozen. <laughs> Councillor Malik. Refuse. Thank you. Councillor McKenzie. Refuse. OK, thank you. So that's unanimously refused. OK, thanks very much, Ms. Mrs McBain. OK, uh, other reports on today's agenda is at 8.1, which is the Planning Enforcement Activity Report. We'll have Mr Gavin Clark. Um, I think looking at the report, you'll have heard, see the amount of work that he's been doing not, not only his day job in terms of planning applications, but also the enforcement officer. Um, he's going to give us a short presentation. And if there's any questions, um, feel free at the end of this. Mr. Gavin Clark, thank you. Thank you, convener. I'll, I'll keep this short because I'm, I'm sure you'll all want to get away for your lunch soon. Um, the report provides an annual update in relation to enforcement work undertaken by development management between the 1st of April 2020 and 31st of March 2021. This has involved investigation of 191 cases during the reporting period, which have either been subject to retrospective applications, resolved through negotiation, uh, have been minor and deemed not expedient to enforce, dealt with by colleagues in spaces for people, or there was no planning breach. Uh, 52 of these cases remain under investigation, in addition to a further 12 cases from pre-April 2020, which are still to be resolved. Um, all cases are detailed in um, Appendix 1. 
One of the biggest issues we've dealt with this year has related to the formation of outdoor seating areas uh, in relation to spaces for people. Uh, the Scottish Government provided advice to local authorities relating to enforcement, stating that planning authorities should take a positive and supportive approach uh, to allow temporary use for on-street seating for cafes and bars, beer gardens and similar accommodation uh, to accommodate physical distancing. In such situations, it is common not to take enforcement action at this time uh, for a temporary period. It should be noted that the vast majority of the outdoor seating areas uh, and associated structures created during the COVID uh, public health emergency uh, are not intended to be permanent features. And when requirements for physical distancing, particularly in relation to indoor and outdoor hospitality, uh, are relaxed, the expectation is most of these will be removed. The Council may need to take further action in the future if some of these structures remain in situ without planning permission and agreed agreement on removal cannot be reached voluntarily. Um, in addition, in the reporting period, the planning service have also made um, enforcement notices publicly available um, online. Uh, the service will continue to make further information related to enforcement publicly available. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Gavin. Councillor Allen. Thank you, convener, and I'm quite sure that Gavin Clark will be aware of what I'm about to say. And, and it's about the disgrace, in my opinion, the disgraceful overuse of window advertising on Victoria Road. I have complained several times and my constituents are still very angry about the state of Victoria Road. And I just wondered, I couldn't see anything in the report about Victoria Road, but I just wondered if I could have an update on what is going on there. Yeah, in terms of Victoria Road, we, we have looked into this issue previously and um, sent various bits of correspondence out to various properties on Victoria Road and are struggling to get responses. And it had just been a potential case that it's, because of the, the, the amount of workload we had, we've not been able to look into this further. But it is something that, that we can look again in the future and try and get resolution on, on these issues. Because we are aware of the issue, we are aware that, that consents are required. So it's, it's something that we, when we get a bit of time, we, we can look into a little bit further. OK, thank you for that. It's just that every time they take over another shop within a day, you can't even see through the window because of the advertising. So I would appreciate if some sort of emergency could be um, referred to Victoria Road. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, uh, Councillor Cook. Thanks, convener. Just a brief one. Um, page 190 of the report mentions the for, uh, former Treetops Hotel site as being uh, pending investigation um it, it kind of crops up quite often at the community, local community council i just wondered if you'd give us an update on that one i think it has been looked at a couple of times uh since christmas um and i just wondered what what the current status is yeah i mean this is one i'm not directly involved in this there's, there's others in, in the service but uh, it's one that we don't think there's there's no planning breach at the moment, but we're just keeping it open just in case anything happens in the future that, that may need may need us to look at. But the demolition itself um, is not something we're directly involved in, uh, and we don't consider there's a breach on site um, at the moment. Thanks for that. That's great. That's it. Thanks, Thanks for calling me. Yeah, thank you, Convener. It's on page 190 again, uh, Gavin. Um, landed Forest Hill Court. Flats under construction without planning appro approval. Is that is it still? I mean, Grampian Housing got approval for that site, but is that is that the stretch <coughs> that they've started building on at the end? What it used to be the Bowling Green, the Forest Hill Bowling Green between Burnside Gardens and Westburn Road. It's the this enforcement query that the pending one relates to. Yeah, this is. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. So, sorry, uh, is that better? Okay. It relates to the, yes, that's the southern section of the site, and I believe there's an application pending, subject to the conclusion of a legal agreement, and work had started on site before before that had been concluded. So, I mean, is that the bit that I'm speaking about? We used to be the former Bowling Green. It's just yes, yes. As far as I'm aware, that's the site. Yes. So you've stopped the work there, have they? They have. They have stopped work there. Yes. How far on were they going? 
I believe they were quite far on with the work uh, when it was reported to us that, um, but they have stopped on site until they, they get they get the planning permission in place because that is still pending subject to the conclusion of a legal agreement. So the structure is up and in place without planning consent. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kadir. Okay, thanks, Councillor Cormie. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any other hands. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Clark. You've done a, an excellent job, and I'm sure you'll get onto Council Allen's um, Victoria Road because it, you know it's a beautiful road actually, and it's a shame that it's been blighted with this. So I think I'm sure it will uh, be a welcome intera in interaction by you. Um, the next meeting is obviously for the the planning meeting is the Thursday, the 20th of May. This afternoon, I'd just like to remind members we've got a pre-application forum, um, which is for um, bat battery space energy storage facility at Farnburn Place, Dice. We reckon it'll probably run maybe about 40 minutes, just to give you an indication, depending on how many questions you have. So I uh, look forward to seeing as many of you as you that turn up at 2 o'clock. Okay, but thanks everybody. Thanks officers um, for your input today and um, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.